place where people can connect to grow in Christ and reach out for his kingdom. And it is so good to have you here so that we can worship the Lord together this morning. And you picked a great morning to be here. We're continuing in our journey uh, through the, the, the story of the early church in Acts. We're going to observe the Lord's Supper together, which is always a great time uh, to be in the Lord's house to do that. we got folks joining us uh, online, too, and they're going to be participating with us at the same time in the same way, so that's cool. But we're not just here doing this. We're, we're extending all around the community and beyond uh, as we worship the Lord together this morning. Uh, a couple of things to know is, one, keep making, keep signing up. Every single week, keep signing up. As you do that, it just takes a couple of clicks. In fact, you can, I'll give you permission to pull out your phone, and you can do it right where you're sitting if you already know you're going to be here next week. So there, you've got permission. You can do it like right in between announcements and when Dana starts. You're going to do it quick. Uh, but do that for us. Uh, we've got student events again tonight for the middle school students and the high school students. Those have been going terrifically. They're loving being together. It's good to see them starting to interact again. Uh, but that's a better. We're not going to pray and we're going to seek the Lord together this morning. Father, we're grateful that we can be here in your presence, not because your presence is somehow stuck in this building, but because your people are here. And where your people are, there you are. And so as we gather in your name this morning, seeking you out, being reminded of the story that we're a part of as a church, drive us forward. Drive us forward to be more fully who you designed us to be, to your great glory, to our immense joy. Let us experience you and all your goodness so that we can know you more and follow you because of that. We ask that this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. It is wonderful to be with you this morning. Um, I won't give too many signs this morning because I know you are holding the precious Lord's Supper elements in your hand today. So uh, let me just share with you this beautiful words of this song for the cause in the chorus Christ we proclaim proclaim the name above every name for all creation every nation God's salvation through his son and I pray that even this week you may have the opportunity the Lord would open up the doors that you would be able to proclaim or share the gospel with someone this week
Good morning. So for this morning's elementary devotion, we're going to be introing the sermon just briefly a little bit. Because the sermon's going to be talking about a story. A story of two men who proclaimed the gospel in a very, very bold fashion. See, the government did not like them proclaiming the gospel. They got in trouble. How many of y'all have been in trouble? Hopefully not with the law, but with your parents before. How many of y'all are in trouble with your parents right now? <laughs> few, 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 few of y'all. So they were in trouble, so we can relate to that. Hopefully not with the government or with the law, but they were in trouble with the government or in with the law. And so you could say that they were in a bit of a conundrum. How many of y'all know what this is? What is this? Chinese hand trap, right? They were in trouble, and they were, as you could say, maybe imprisoned. They were in trap. They were in a situation. Now, see if I can get myself out of this. How, what's the way you get yourself out of these things? Somebody tell me. Push it together. My fingers aren't coming out, y'all. I'm pushing it together, and my fingers are not coming out together. What's wrong with y'all? What else? What else do I have to do? Push it together, and then... And then what do I do? It's not working. Let me help you out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the way that you get out of these is not by brute strength, right? The way that you get out of these is not by just pulling as hard as you can. That this was probably on its last legs. So if you pull as hard as you can, what are you going to do? Eventually. It's going to tear. It's going to break. So the way you get out of these is not by brute strength. It's not by force. It's by humbly recognizing you have to push it together, and then slowly but surely, releasing yourself in a humble, not aggressive, fashion. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, is that as we proclaim the gospel, we're going to find ourselves in situations that require boldness. In situations that may get us into situations that are uncomfortable. May get us into situations that we may find ourselves in a little bit of trouble. School, for adults, work, for our friend groups. So what we're going to learn today is that when we get in those situations, the way to get yourself out of them is not by brute strength. It's not by forcing our opinion down people's throats. It's not by attacking them for their beliefs. It's not by being overly strong and aggressive. No, what is it? It's being humble, kind, meek, and slowly and smartly working yourself out of that conflict. We're going to see an example of that in the sermon today. Let me open this up in prayer. God, you're awesome. I thank you for your love. I thank you for who you are. I ask today that as we learn from your word today about the story of your two disciples who got into a situation because of their faith, got into a situation because of the gospel, and as we ourselves find ourselves in situations that you have led us to, that you have brought us to, that as we're being bold in sharing our faith, and we find situations that to make this uncomfortable, maybe we're getting into a little bit of trouble for your name, that you would help us not to be the one that's pushing everybody else around, the one that's being loud, the one that's being argumentative, but that you would help us with humility, to get ourselves out of whatever trouble we're in, out of whatever situation we're in, in a way that glorifies our name. I thank you for your love. I thank you for who you are. In your precious most holy name, I pray. Amen. Thanks for that. Now, think about the words they just said. Think about the words that they just sang just a minute ago. Situations we get ourselves into because we're going for the cause of Christ. For the cause of Christ we go. It's a stirring call to action for followers of Jesus. It's right in line with what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks as we started this journey into the book of Acts, looking at the story of the early church. We have a big task. Jesus said, be our witnesses in all, ultimately all the world. Start here and it's just spread out until you've covered everything. That's a lot of ground, but our God's big. 
Like he's called us to action. But, but do you know why we have a cause? I'll give you a hint. It's not because of Jesus' call to action. It's not because of his teachings. It's not because of his miracles. It's really not even because of his life, per se. It's because he rose from the grave. That's why. But in order to be able to rise, he first had to die. In the greatest injustice ever perpetrated in the whole history of humanity, the perfect Son of God was nailed to a cross, a Roman cross, in a move engineered by the ruling religious authorities of the day, carried out by professional Roman executioners, and he hung there until he died. In doing this, though, as Peter himself argued in the passage that we looked at just last week, and we'll even make mention of again in the passage we're going to look at this morning, God was the one pulling all the strings. The leaders thought they were in charge, but if only, if only they knew. Jesus died by the long foretold plans of the Father, who was bringing, us, bringing to all of us life. His body was broken and his blood was spilled so that the doors to eternal life would be thrown open for all who care to enter them and enjoy the relationship with their Heavenly Father that they had always been designed to have from the beginning. This is such a significant thing that Jesus himself, before he died, gave us a way and a command to remember his death until he comes again. We are going to follow that command this morning together. If you would name Jesus as your Lord and Savior, find that little cup you got, you got when you came in this morning. In it, you'll see a, you'll see a little bit of bread right on top, a little bit of juice right underneath there. If you'll tear the first part of the top off, don't grab too deep or you're going to have juice all over you first. Tear the first part of that top off, and you'll find a little piece of bread. In the bread, we are reminded that Jesus willingly gave his body over to be broken into pieces in order to pay the price for our sins, yours and mine. Let us eat together this morning in remembrance of him. to be the church together 
the church, our faithful God created us to be. This rooting in the cross is what will carry us forward faithfully. Would you pray with me? Father, we are grateful for the cross. We're grateful for this reminder that you are so, you are so committed to our life, to being in a relationship with us. You let yourself be, your son be put to death so that we might live. And it's in his death that we live now. It's in his life that we move forward to receive what you have for us. Help us keep that reality, that historical reality, firmly in our hearts and minds. And by that, call us to the kind of boldness that we'll see your kingdom advance. We ask that this morning as we continue to seek you out together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me have a little bit of a survey with you this morning. Did you raise your hand? Yes, you raise your hand. No, on this. We see the question there. Do you think that Christians today have more or less freedom than we did to, per to pursue our faith than we did 10 years ago? If you would say more freedom, raise your hand nice and high. Okay, if you would say less freedom, raise your hand nice and high. Okay. Change the question on you a little bit. Do you think that Christians have more or less cultural power than we did 10 years ago? If you would say more, raise them nice and high. Yeah, if you would say less, raise them nice and high. Okay. okay. Confession time. I wasn't totally sure the kind of response they give to that, but I had, I had an idea. And my guess was that most self-professed followers of Jesus would answer just exactly like all of you did. There were almost no exceptions except the folks who were like, no, I don't raise my hand, I can help you do that. And you said, last of both. Like, what about the truth, though? The truth is that, yes, in terms of cultural power, the church and Christians generally, in this culture at least, that really worldwide, are in about the worst place we've been really in the history of this nation. The church and followers of Jesus generally are not looked to as leaders for many things anymore. In fact, if you feel like the world hates you more for being a Jesus person than at any time in your memory, you're right. Because it does. But, in terms of the legal freedom, to live out our faith without fear of harassment by at least the federal government, things have actually never been better. The state of religious liberty in this country right now in terms of constitutional law, at that standpoint, is better than it has ever been. In terms of religious liberty alone, there isn't anywhere else in the entire world better than the United States. There have been, I think 15 major Supreme Court cases dealing with religious liberty in recent years. You know how many of those went in the direction of religious liberty? All of them. All 15. Every single one of them. But, with the loss of cultural power, it doesn't feel much like it sometimes, does it? Think of what interesting times we live in as followers of Jesus today. We have at one and the same time, think about this, we have at one and the same time more freedom and less power to pursue our faith than we arguably ever had anywhere in the whole of the world or in the annals of church history. What all of this means is that in some ways our situation today is a whole lot more like the situation of the early church than we might like to think about it. Now, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen that the members of that early church, after Jesus departed the scene, started to pick back up the pieces by taking just one right next step after, the, after, the, after another. They, they had to go from there and start building. Right? And we saw how the church had its explosive start when the Holy Spirit descended on that original group of disciples. Now, last week, you know, as we saw that, we reflected a bit deeper on the practices and the character traits that early group put in place under the Spirit's direction that made sure that they were built to last and structured for success. Getting organized and into an actual, defined group, it was important. That had to happen before they could go into the house. But there was actually...
be one more important step that they needed to take if they were going to start reaching to the full potential that Jesus designed them to have, that Jesus had called them to have. They had to actually start going somewhere. Well, going somewhere requires something of us. Have you ever gotten all ready for a trip, but then didn't leave? You probably haven't, because that'd be kind of silly. You have to get everything packed in a bag, get the car loaded up, and then not ever pull out of the driveway? Nobody does that. Put that much effort into it, it'd be a silly waste of time and energy. And yet, getting ready for a journey, is one thing. Actually taking that journey is something else in time. You see, right up to the point you actually leave, it is all theory and ideas. Right? They may be grand ideas and a compelling theory, but that's all they are. They don't really pose any threat to you just yet. But right when you take that first step, things rush in the eye. And they just may not be quite like you imagined they were. The fear of that moment, of that first step moment, makes taking that first step a lot more challenging than you might think it should be. Well, as we've just remembered together in our observing of the Lord's Supper, the movement of which we're a part is driven by some really grand ideas. The God who created the world and everything in it is so committed to seeing you become fully who he designed you to be, to his glory, to your joy, that he was willing for his own son to be brutally put to death in order to pay the price for your sins and open the gates, the door, open the gates to a relationship with and then on the third day, he rose again. Like I said, big ideas. And the theory is that once he left the scene, like we talked about last week and the week before, the task that he left us to complete was not done. But he didn't leave us alone. He sent us the Holy Spirit to empower and equip us for the work that he left us so that not only are we never alone in pursuing it, but we are never without everything we need to accomplish it. Compelling theory. But, ready as we may be, nothing is going to happen unless and until we actually start to go somewhere. And as I said, that going somewhere takes something of us. In fact, it demands it. It demands boldness. And as we continue telling our story with the help of Luke's record of Acts of the early church, that's exactly what we're going to see in the next couple of chapters here, Acts chapters 3 and 4, in some pretty inspiring ways, I may mention. As we pick up the story in chapter 3 this morning, and again, I can't read all this to you right now. We'll be out of time, so I want to encourage you to go home and read these two chapters when you get there. Right? Go home and read these, because this is an amazing story, just like they told us. What we do is we find Peter and John, here at the beginning of chapter 3, heading into the temple for a time of prayer. Now, this is a daily event that all Jews who were able and in the city of Jerusalem participated in. There were people going in and out of the temple every day, all day long. It was a busy place. It was the center of social life. Well, whether they were going there to actually participate in the time of prayer or do some more evangelistic activities, Luke doesn't tell us. What he does tell us, though, is that as they walked into the temple that morning, they came across a man that everybody knew and recognized. Everybody knew who this guy was. It was a beggar who had been there for years. He was much a fixture in that temple as the walls were. He was a lame beggar who had been lame since birth, and somebody brought him to the beautiful gate every single day so that he could beg, ask for handouts. Well, just like he did every day, this man on this particular day was calling for passers-by to have pity on him, give him some alms, give him a little money so that he could have something to eat that day. Don't you feel sorry for me? Besides, you're in the temple, so God's watching extra close so you can feel good about him. For whatever reason... We'll call it the, the prompting of the Holy Spirit. That day, Peter and John happened to use his gate to go into the temple. And when this man's cries fell on their ears, for whatever reason, they stopped. They spoke to him briefly. You can read this. It's an amazing encounter. And then they healed him in Jesus' name. And his legs and ankles became strong again. Well, this understandably created quite the stir. For folks to, to see this man that they all knew again, everybody knew this guy because he was in the same gate, the same spot every day. For them to see this man that they knew just as the cripple at the beautiful gate, now that was its name, not its description, jumping and dancing and glorifying God at the top of their lungs, they wanted to know what happened. How did this happen? This is the kind of stuff that Jesus had done, but he's not around anymore, so who could be doing something like this? 
tithing began to grow. But they didn't have to wonder for long because the man was literally hanging on Peter and John, shouting for the whole complex to hear, These guys did this! Well, like he'd done on the day of Pentecost, Peter seized the moment so that he could point the people back to Jesus. He proclaimed the gospel to them right then and there. But he doesn't do it in the way that you write on it. In fact, at the beginning of his message here, he sounds uncomfortable like one of those angry street preachers that everybody loves to hate. He accuses the crowd of killing Jesus. You killed the source of life, he looked at him and told him. He goes on to bring back to repentance, though, and the forgiveness of sins. But, but in the middle of their sermon, Peter and John were arrested by the Sadducees, who were irritated, Luke tells us, because they had been proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. If you remember, historically, uh, theologically, the Sadducees did not believe in any kind of a resurrection. They only accepted Genesis to Deuteronomy as scripture, which didn't talk about resurrection, so they didn't believe it, period. They wanted to shut these guys up. They thought they were lunatics. And they figured a night in jail and an intimidating appearance before the entire gathered Jewish ruling council would cower them into silence. Except it didn't. Standing before the Sanhedrin, the full gathered Jewish ruling council the next morning, Peter basically picks back up where he left off the day before, proclaiming Jesus as Messiah and salvation in his name alone. The group was just stunned. All they could do was marvel at the boldness of these two. What could give them the kind of courage standing where they were in front of this group with no more education in the life that they had to say the things that they're saying? There, there was only one thing that could have done it. Luke tells us in verse 13 of chapter 4, if you jump down to there, when they observed the boldness of Peter and John, realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed, just like we said. But what was it that they attributed this boldness to? Look at the rest of the verse. They were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. That was the only thing they could figure out. Something about this Jesus made these men bold beyond what any of their thought wisdom should have allowed. Let me ask you, being with Jesus made you bold? Listen, Peter and John did not have anything you and I don't ourselves have as fellow followers of Jesus. Nothing. In fact, we've got more than they did. We've got this thing. We didn't have this. They just had this part. They were simply so convinced that it was true that they were willing to act on it regardless of what the immediate physical consequences may have been. Indeed, Peter and John are threatened with more arrests, imprisonment, even physical beatings. In the face of that, they openly promise to defy if they felt God so needy. Verse 19, Peter and John answered them, Whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than God, you don't want to question God, do you? You decide that. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. And San Diego would just throw up their hands. And they sit on the way. They, they threaten to beat him if they speak about Jesus again, a threat with which they follow through. But the apostles had the crowds, the, the dramatic healing the day before, it sure helped them that. And so these political leaders' hands were tied. They couldn't do anything. It was politics that saved Peter and John in the moment. Well, when the parable released, they went immediately back to their brothers and sisters and told them about what happened. Right? The group then broke into this spontaneous time of prayer. You can read this starting in verse 23. In the first time I read this prayer, it really was paying attention, not just kind of scanning over because it was the Bible reading for the day. My jaw hit the floor. I'm telling you, if we make their prayer here our prayer, there really isn't anything that we won't be able to accomplish as a church. Right? There are no barriers that will hold us back from reaching the full potential God has built into our community here. None. You with me? This, this is powerful stuff for what we're going to see here. 
And they start in this prayer by praising God for his sovereignty and his power. They say, God, you're the one who's in charge. When you're facing a challenge that's bigger than you, it's important to remember that you serve a God who's bigger than your challenge. Amen. They, they acknowledge together that they're, they're, that even though the, the forces of power in this city thought that they were doing whatever they pleased in putting Jesus to death, it was really God himself who was behind the scenes controlling the whole thing from the start, like he said. And now these same forces were conspiring against them again, flexing their political muscle once again. And while knowing what's true from before is good, if we're honest in the midst of a present challenge, it's sometimes easy to forget about everything but that present challenge. What happened before is fine. <laughs> I want help here and now. Right? So then what do they think? What was it that made my jaw hit the floor when I realized what they were saying? The cash We do that. Was it safety? It certainly makes sense. Was it comfort? We like that. Was it just open doors to share the gospel without worrying about the consequences? No, I wouldn't even those things. Listen to this, verse 29. And now, Lord, consider their threats. Are you ready for this? Are you sure you're ready for this? And now, Lord, consider their threats. And grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand for healing, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Q prayerful mic drop. In other words, God, you do your thing and help us stay bold in our ways. Well, yeah, but what about? <laughs> but you see, there weren't any one last here. It was only faithful boldness. God, whatever might happen to us, and they may very well carry through on their threats, don't make good on them, they, they certainly be concerned with being bold first. And you take care of your part. That was it. And the kingdom expanded. Jesus' kingdom advances on the boldness of his followers. Listen, now. our culture doesn't like Christianity anymore. Haven't for a long time, but it really doesn't like it. She does <laughs> a primetime talking head on CNN head tonight in trying to make a point about the founding fathers not being worthy of the adoration they often receive, argue that, well, nobody claims that Jesus was perfect when he was here on earth. Folks who make that kind of argument about Jesus himself, they don't have any patience for his followers. And that wasn't an isolated ignorance. Governor after governor during this pandemic has had no problem openly trying to restrict the liberty of followers of Jesus and other people of faith while openly allowing causes they support to go on unhindered. Openly done that. It's the very fact that there have been 15 major Supreme Court religious liberty wins in the last few years is that there have been 15 major religious liberty challenges in the last 15 years. Now, okay, fine, we don't get threatened with violence often like they were, although it still comes to our doors. But an increasingly powerful cancel culture is just fine seeing this canceled out of existence if it can. That's just, the, that's just where we are. The easy response to all of this, though, for Christians who are remembering what life was like then, is to hunker down in a little Christian conclave to pray for protection. That's the natural response. Many believers make that prayer their very own. Listen, where we do, the kingdom of God retreats. Friends, our call is not to retreat in the work the Lord has sent us to accomplish. We've got to move forward. We've got to step out and see the kingdom advance, just like it did for our brothers and sisters here in Acts. That will happen today when we summon the courage to prayerfully step out and speak his words with all boldness. Jesus' kingdom advances on the boldness of his followers. Now, 
This doesn't mean being unwise or unloving or not. It's quite the opposite. It demands that. But sometimes we hide behind not wanting to be unwise or unloving and remain in the safety of our comfort zones rather than summoning the boldness to see the kingdom advance. Jesus' kingdom advances on the boldness of his followers. If we are going to see God's great plans for us come to fruition here at First Baptist Oak Park, then listen, with everything he's got going on in this town, he's got some great plans for us. It's going to require boldness. He's moving in our midst. He's moving in our community. The ground's already prepared. The crop is coming to bear. We need only step out with boldness and begin harvesting the fruit as it comes. Here is your challenge. What is one thing you can do to be prayerfully bold for the kingdom of Israel? Just go ahead. Think about that. Father, thank you for the example of the church here in these couple of chapters of Acts. The example that when they were threatened, they didn't count, but neither did they hate. They loved and proclaimed the gospel with boldness. Let us follow their example as a church. Let us be humbly gently, lovingly bold in our efforts to follow you in expanding your kingdom in this community and beyond. Create a foundation here of trust that is so convinced of the truth of what we find in your word that we're willing to move forward with it regardless of what we have. Because we know that when your kingdom advances, we win. Let us be a place of boldness. So that we can see lives transformed. Lives that are broken, restored. So that we can see places where love is lacking, filled with it. Where needs that are going unmet can be overwhelmed. Let us be a church. Let us be your church. We ask that in Jesus' name this morning and for his sake. Amen. Thank you again for being here this morning. The challenge is great, but our God is greater. And we follow him boldly. There's just no telling what he can do. Remember to sign up. You can do it before you leave your chair. If you need to, you can always just text me directly and I'll get you set up so we'll wait for next week so the room is, as you can see, ready for you. We're, we're thinking about you every single week. We're ready to do this with you so we can continue doing it. Have a great, great week. We'll see you Wednesday at 2. We'll be open over there and online as well. We'll be back here next Sunday. Let me pray for you. God, give us boldness and a faithful trust in who you are. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.